about time to get uh, started in this uh, seminar. My name is uh, Jesper Bengel, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Kira Stakova, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Physics, Chemistry, and Pharmacy. And she has been an uh, associate professor since uh, 2012. And uh, Kira is a prime example that we here at SDU uh, have a lot of uh, younger research, uh, researchers with um, an incredible talent and potential to really become an uh, internationally uh, leading uh, researcher. Kira got her education from Moscow, from Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, uh, in uh, 2004, when Kira was 19 years old, uh, she co-authored her first uh, research paper, and already one year later, uh, the second one. And uh, today she is uh, she is uh, author of uh, 35 uh, research uh, papers. Uh, we have uh, been so fortunate to uh, uh, have uh, Kira as a collaborator here since uh, 2006 as a PhD student. She came here for some time, then she went back to Moscow finished her PhD, and uh, then as a postdoc, she, she came back to, uh, to the nucleic acid center. Uh, she has been developing her own research, and she has established, uh, for example, collaborations with industry. She has established uh, collaboration with research groups in, uh, at the University of California and at Stanford, where she is also uh, regularly a, a visitor. Um, so, and, and, and so Kira is really is really um, uh, doing very well. She has uh, she's obtained a Sava Aude grant, and now she is a Willem Foundation a young investigator with a 10 million grant a Krona grant to to develop her research, and that is in between. Uh, organic chemistry, modeling, biotechnology. She is a true chemical biologist, and. Uh, and uh, what she will tell us about today is uh, diagnostics, so detection of nucleic acids um, in very uh, specific uh, way. So, Kia, we look forward to your lecture. Thank you, yes, sir. Um, I hope to live up to that <laughs> presentation. Yes, my name is Kira, and I've been here for years um, working with nucleic acids with the primary focus on diagnosis, which I want to present today. And yeah, so to outline what I want to talk to you about today is I want to start by introduction and discuss why we need to know DNA and RNA sequences, including mutations for biological species. How is it done now? and what can be improved. Um, then I want to present you our pilot study where we um, develop a new, I don't want to call it sequencing method, but it is actually a different, different sequencing approach than the one that's been used now. And this is done by Click Chemistry, which I also want to talk about. And then I will finish by perspective and a bit of discussion, what, in a bit broader perspective, what this all is about and discovery. Ultra fast specific discovery of nucleic acid sequences, what it means for the society and for the research community. So you are welcome to stop me at any moment if you have questions. So um, yeah, I want to start like when, when I say us, us, what are what are us? We doing with I have a research group here at the University of Southern Denmark. And we do interdisciplinary research focusing on nucleic acids, their analogs and interactions. We collaborate a lot, so you also in Denmark and across the globe. I'm very happy about collaborators in Denmark. And you would already met Jesper, right? There are some other guys which I'm really happy to collaborate with. And yeah, we, we, this is just for this project, those who have been contributing. And we also work with industry, yes, that's true. Um, this project in particular is done in collaboration with Thermo Fisher Scientific and ProMega. Very nice collaboration. We are very proud to, to 
Uh, yeah, so this is all pretty much my background. Jesper already talked about, so I'm Russian, <coughs> I come from here, yes. When I was quite young uh, and was interested about nucleic acid chemistry, I got to Denmark. And that was the time where nucleic acid center has been established and that all influenced <coughs> my, my research a lot and inspired actually this project too. Uh, under my undergraduate studies, I worked, worked for Ox Oxford GeneSec and as a synthetic chemist, already got this inspiration from all the sequencing, developing stories, genotyping and stuff like that. And then I was also quite curious, curious what happens here in this part. So I, I worked here in Boston and then also in California in different places. So, and I still work actually at all of these places once, once in a while and I get a bit different experiences from here there. And my key interest, yeah. So this was, I just wanted to show you that this is the place where I graduated from. It's built as double-stranded DNA. <laughs> so I actually always thought that that was my office here in this third, yeah, it's on the third floor. So it was kind of, I don't know, meant to be a, yeah, so this is just funny building as a double-stranded DNA here. And my research interest, as Jesper already said, is chemistry primary. So I have a training as a synthetic organic chemist. But then I shifted a bit to biotechnology and biomedicine. And for the last many years worked with nucleic acids, integrating these disciplines. So I was so lucky to study in 2000s. 2000s is the boom in nucleic acid research in biotechnology. I call them an I hope it's okay, nucleic acid, yeah. So it's all this time when in the beginning when I just got my masters, no one really used PCR. <laughs> For much things, right? And then all this happened. Amplification, sequencing, the human genome project was finished in 2003. And, it, and then late 2000s, imaging including super resolution techniques. All of this happened very fast and I remember like very um, getting excited every year from new techniques coming, new discoveries. And yeah, so it all contributed to my research interests. And I did organic and medicinal chemistry and then shifted to, to bioorganic chemistry for fluorescent nucleic acid probes that we did in Oxford Gene Technology. So already at that time we applied fluorescence for sequencing of nucleic acids. And then later on I worked at the hospital in Moscow where we clinically applied sequencing and PCR microarrays also for immunology. In 2009, I started doing postdoc here at SDU, integrating all of that a bit together. And from 12 to 15, I also worked in states, where my main focus was actually autoimmunity and oncology, so applications of all of these technologies in medicine. So it's quite a mix, one can say, but um, yeah, I'm going there. So just to kind of get an idea, where are we now? So how many of you have heard about the genetic code? If I should interest, yes. <laughs> genetic code, yes. So quite some, right? But then, so this is the first part, which is very important to, <laughs> to what I'm gonna talk about, is that A pairs to T and C pairs to G. These are nucleotides and they form the genetic code. And there is another nucleotide, an RNA, it's called UPU. And this is essential of living species, um, of inheritance, and, and I guess you also saw this, this part, that DNA gets tr transcribed to RNA, and then it translates to protein, and a bit recent information saying that not all RNA becomes protein, but also some RNA molecules are regulatory RNA, which regulate other RNA and never get to protein. So I hope all of you know, or most of you know this part. Um, a big part of my work is, is the discovery of a detection of mutations. So sometimes things happen in genetic code, and there come alterations. So the st standard, this ATCG correct sequence, it gets some variations. And an example could be A, a <coughs> becoming instead of, here should be C, but it becomes A, and then it doesn't base pair. Or for example, TT, we call it a mismatch, or a mutation. And these mutations, um, they happen all the time, while, while we in living species, 
Many of them, they're called neutral polymorphisms. They, do, they do not have biological effect. But some of them, especially in oncology, for example, they have a crucial impact. If they occur in oncogenes, for example, and then the, the patient can develop cancer. So some of them are important to detect some of these mutations. Yes, nucleic acid chemistry, biophysics, and biotechnology are my major fields of knowledge. Here you can see the, the sequence of nucleic acids. So it has three main parts. It has the nitrogen bases, this ATCG genetic code. Then it has also phosphate backbone and sugar. And because I am a chemist, so when I look at this, I see a chemical. I see it, it's very advanced. It has many different groups, but this is a chemical. And it has quite different, this chemically, these are quite different parts. The first one is nucleobase. It is a heterocycle. So the type of organic reaction that one can do on base is quite specific. When we move to sugar chemistry, this is a whole different story. Mm -hmm. A part of my group is working now on sugar chemistry. They're not really <laughs> happy about it. It's quite a tricky one. And these are whole different reactions what you can do on this part of DNA and RNA. And the phosphate chemistry is also quite different. It can be done enzymatically, it can be done chemically, you can combine both of them. And the phosphorus chemistry is the one which cells are running all the time to, to polymerize this, this DNA and RNA and to create new cells with new genome. So for me as a chemist working with nucleic acids, there's been always a lot of different methods, reactions we could do here. And Never ever I got bored in the lab working with them. <laughs> These are really great, great molecules, I think, DNA and RNA. And in, in cells, they form the, when the two of them meet and there is a base pairing, they form a duplex. And on the slide, you can see this is ideal B DNA, B type DNA. And this is the structure that has been discovered in 1953 by Watson and Crick, explaining the recognition between nucleic acid polymers. And as I already said, A pairs to T and C to G. And this is why this complex is formed. If there are alteration, variants, or mutation, or whatever you call it, then there is no base pairing here. And the duplex structure slightly changes. What we want to do in our work, we want to detect this change very specifically. And there's a high sensitivity as well. Uh, here I want to say, so this key paradigm of work of nucleic acid within the cells. And why I think, uh, I believe it's so important to know this sequence very precisely. It's because what we call primary structure of nucleic acid, so just sequence A, T, C, D for DNA, it encodes the secondary structure, so this duplex formation, for example. Uh, the way it looks, the way it geometry is formed depends <coughs> completely on the sequence. And this secondary structure is a foundation for then for tertiary structure, which is a, could be quite complex, for example, for some RNA, quite complex um, three-dimensional structure. So once again, so primary structure is the fundament for, for function, actually, for formation of functional nucleic acid com complexes and their interactions with proteins, with peptides, with small molecules. It is very, very important to know this, this sequence. And having done some chemistry or having modified this sequence, you actually influence this part and in that way influence this part. Keeping in mind what is the function of nucleic acids in cells, this is a big power. <laughs> if you can affect the inheritance material of the cell. This is very uh, intriguing, <laughs> intriguing aspect. <coughs> yeah, so, uh, and the same concept works also for proteins. So also the primary structure encodes the secondary and tertiary. And this is also the reason why there was so much attention on sequencing, on decoding the primary sequence of nucleic acids. That was done in order to understand their secondary and tertiary structure and understand how it connects to function of the particular sequences in cells. 
So sequence is storing brief. I don't want to, to give you a lot of information about it, but from very beginning of the nucleic acid technology, there were attempts to sequence them. And the first methods were degradation methods, so it just purified the, the nucleic acid from, from the biological sample and then degraded it, cut in small pieces by other chemical or enzymatic method, and then tried to analyze what the pieces are and then put it all together. But quite fast, the community found out this is not very efficient. You need a lot of material. It's very biased. So it shifted to the synthesis methods or sequencing by synthesis, which is mimicking normal synthesis of nucleic acid polymer itself. And having a template which is not degraded, not degraded polymer, then step by step creating a complementary one using the same genetic code, A pairing to T and C pairing to G, and identifying every single base which is included allows to decode the sequence. And this is what modern sequencing is doing. It has a lot of name, again, this mutation has lots of name. It's called Illumina, next generation sequencing, sequencing by fluorescent terminators, and so on and so on. But it is step by step incorporating complementary nucleotides to the template. And at each step, it detects it by fluorescence, by color. For example, C nucleotide, C letter, will give this one, G another one, A third one, and C fourth one. And then the machine records color at each particular step. And that's how a final sequence is given. If there is a mismatch or, or mutation at some part, the sequencing will tell about that by incorporating this particular letter. Yeah, and the read, this is the key term here. The read is the length, simply, simply the sequence of the target DNA that has been sequenced. This is called read. And this is all done now automatically. I don't think that anyone here, maybe someone remembers sequencing gels. <laughs> I've done sequencing gels myself. But I don't think anyone who started late 2000s have ever seen them, this huge, very large gels. But it's all done now automatically. And maybe, for example, Illumina is the platform for sequencing. Um, what is important here also to say is that it's all done enzymatically. So it's an enzyme, again, it's all mimicking cellular processes. So step by step enzyme incorporates this complementary complementary nucleotides. There is an issue with nucleic acids uh, that typically in the biological samples they are present at very small amount, very small amount. And how to deal with that? So this is an important biotechnological method that is being used now. It's called amplification. And this is the, for example, polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. It's not the only one, but this is the one which is used most often now. It's the biochemical technology to amplify signal of few copies of DNA, uh, generating more of it, basically. So, for example, let's now think about the sample. This is some bacteria or virus or, that has a nucleic acid in it that we want to see. The first thing to do is to purify its nucleic acid material. And then because it's such a small amount usually, we need to run amplification, also using enzymes. And then we have more of this sample, which is subjected to, for example, Illumina sequencing. And that generates this data. So looking into this pathway, First, what I, what I see is it's multi-step process. It has one, at least one, one, two, three, right, three, but actually more than that, three steps. But the <coughs> problem with this method is that when we have the sequencing data, actually this is not sample A. <laughs> this is the data for, for station D and this path. So the workflow already has affected the initial sample quite quite a lot in some cases. And having this data in hand, we cannot say that we know, I mean, we can, but, but there is definitely a risk that it is, this data is biased simply because of very long 
workflow. And this is the PCR just to show you how that works. This is initial sequence, then it gets denatured by heat simply. And there is this polymerase which can work under a high temperature that creates more and more of this DNA. While it's creating more and more DNA, it can make mistakes. And it actually does make mistakes sometimes. And especially for detection of mutations, when we want to be very accurate, this can be a big problem. In this project, which I want to present to you today, we are talking about sequencing of RNA, actually, not the DNA, but RNA. So RNA can be also sequenced by Illumina, by next generation sequencing. But in order to do that, first it has to be reverse transcribed DNA, and then sequenced. That adds one extra step, which applies enzymes. And <coughs> here's just a sum up. I don't want to go through all these steps. But this is a workflow for RNA sequencing, which is right now recommended by Illumina technology. It's a lot of steps, and they mention on their own description of this process that be aware of high risk of, of mis misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed mutations. <coughs> and our question was, again, to sum up, what's the problem with next generation sequencing? Uh, this technique is there, and this is great. It, it, it did the very, it, it made very big impact on the commu many communities, right? Also in clinical work. Uh, so please don't get me wrong. I'm not going to criticize it and say that it all is so biased, makes mistakes. It is there and it's doing a great job. But the problem with it is that not a single step of it can be done without applying polymerases. So it, it's all fully dependent on work of enzymes. And these polymerases, they make mistakes. And this is proof now for sure that there is approximately three to sometimes even 7% of incorporated nucleotides value sequence can be mistaken. So not all DNA and RNA sequences can be amplified simply. So I already said that in order to get more material, we need to amplify it. But not all sequences can be amplified. Some of oncogenes, human cancer-related genes, they cannot be ever amplified by enzymes that we have now. So how to detect them? Um, it's very long and expensive. I wrote here expensive. The cost goes down every year, but still it remains being quite expensive workflow. If to let's say if use it in daily work in clinic, especially for RNA sequencing, re results are sometimes highly reproducible. So if we run the same sample a couple of times, the sequence that we obtain is quite different. But my main issue with, with, with this method to detect mutations, and in general, to sequence nucleic acids, that it affects initial sample. So again, if, 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 if you look here, so sample A, then you get B, then you get C, then you get D, sometimes E, sometimes <coughs> F, and then you get the sequencing data. Who says that this is corresponds to what I'm interested in, which is A? So this is a concept which one also calls direct method. Direct method works here. It, it detects the sequence there where it originates from without doing too much of manipulation. We are not the only one who realizes this problem <laughs> with the ongoing sequencing methods. There are some existing alternatives already. And one of them I want to present is called nanopore sequencing, the technology which is now being developed in Oxford University. It has a totally di different principle from enzymatic uh, sequencing. It uses nanopore. Nanopore is a protein-based pore. And the DNA, you can see here, it gets through it. And while this DNA gets through the nanopore, it creates the current change, which is specific for each particular ATCG. And that's how the sequence is detected. It's very inaccurate. And even the producer now says that it's only 80% accurate. So in case of our goal, which is detection of mutations, it's not working right now. There are constantly new updates, new papers on that, which 
claim to improve the specificity and we hope that it's gonna at some point do better. But right now this is what, what it is doing. And the one another interesting alternative which also we are using it's the sequencing by hybridization probes. So if you imagine now this is DNA target and we can create a probe which binds to it to a specific region. And then this is an example which is called branch DNA method. So there is a signal amplifier which has an extra signal to detect this event. Then this is a method to sequence as well. And these are two alternatives which exist right now. And I want to start now the discussion of our own work from, from here, so from hybridization. Our goal is to make the direct methods for detection of nucleotides. That means no amplification, no reverse transcription. Just get directly into the sample, add the probe, signal amplifier, and get the yes or no right away. And why is it good to do that? It's very robust technique. It's very simple workflow. It's, it's fast, it's, it's cheap, and it allows what is very important for us to detect SNPs specifically. Yeah, and we have some preliminary data which have been done for quite some time ago that when we modify, modify chemically nucleic acid, then we can actually create such type of probe that bind very specifically and that can also discriminate mismatches or mutations. By applying fluorescence microscopy, you can do it very specifically and also with a high sensitivity. Right now, one can do signal molecule resolution actually. But this is not needed usually. Usually DNA and RNA are present at some copies per, per sample. So it's not, there is no need in super resolution detection. And chemistry of nucleic acid analogs has been developed here in Odense very well. And um, we use a method which is called oligonucleotide synthesis or here it's DNA synthesis. We can create reagents, it's from the paper that has been published by, by this group here, working in Odense, where we can incorporate modified nucleotides into the DNA. So if you see here, this is actually a synthetic DNA probe that can be created by this method. There is another method also I have to mention. Uh, it's called bioconjugation. Bioconjugation of oligonucleotides, for example, by click chemistry. This is an organic reaction, but it is very good for DNA and RNA chemistry because it can be done in water. Some very good chemical methods, they do not work in water and they are not applicable for nucleic acid chemistry. So this click chemistry allows to take one piece of DNA, the second piece of DNA and just simply put them together. Or take the DNA, take the fluorescent dye or sensor molecule and just put it on it. And it requires two moieties, an azi and an alkyne, and also a catalyst. And it's called click chemistry because it, it works like this, hop, and then it works very fast if it's done right. And so our pilot study is to develop a method which uses this click reads as an alternative to enzymatic synthesis or <coughs> sequence probe, sequence. So what we do, we have the target, and this is all RNA. So we are not working with DNA sequencing here, it's just RNA. And we use a solid support, because it's very neat to wash off all unbound probes. Then we have synthesized this clickable reads, which are some specific for this particular RNA. And then by base pairing, by genetic code to this probe binds to the RNA target. And this is just one step we went. We have a mixture of probes. We add it to RNA on the solid support and just wait like for a couple of minutes. And based on base pairing, this probes will find this unique regions on, on the RNA target. Then we wash off everything that has been not bound and add click chemistry reagents. And because we have these groups for click chemistry on each prime end of the probe, we will get a ligated product afterwards. 
Then we detach this project from the solid support and analyze it. And we have all the techniques developed here how to analyze the DNA and RNA sequences. So this is quite easy. In this pilot study, we designed 50 mer capture probe. So this is 50 nucleotide here to catch the correct RNA from the sample. And then we designed in initial study six 10 mer probes. So six of those. And also some wrong 10 mers so to check the specificity. Some that contain just one single alteration somewhere. We also added them here to this reaction. And just to illustrate once again, so what happens here is that imagine that you have RNA target which has no, no mutation. And the second one which has this SMP or how to call it, mutation is. Then we add the probes. And we, we have hundreds of them. But only the, this that have the base pairing here that are correct ones, they will bind. And afterwards we add the click chemistry reagent and it creates this long synthetic weed. If there is an SMP, this probe is not going to bind. And this will result in a shorter read. And then we can, by analysis method, compare was there an SMP or not. It's very simple. It's very simple, but actually hard to make, though. <laughs> it took some time to get it to work, this reaction. Especially with RNA, it was quite a in order to motivate ourselves, we wanted to select a target which is very relevant for the society and very important one and hard to detect by next generation <coughs> sequences. Uh, we considered viruses right away because they are those which are known to, to use RNA a lot for their survival. So RNA viruses are known to be very hard to detect, hard to treat, but they are mutating a lot. Some examples of RNA viruses are influenza, or not that funny one, HIV, but also the one which has just had this very big outbreak recently in 2014, it's called Ebola. This is an RNA virus which is hard to diagnose because it's very often masking under the influenza. It has very high similarity in genome with influenza. And all the hospitals, clinical wards, diagnostic labs know that it's very hard to distinguish is the patient having an influenza or Ebola. And the reason for that is high number of mutations that it has, plus similarity to influenza genome. Uh, it's, quite <coughs> it, it's quite scary virus, actually. It has affected many people, and the survival chance of having Ebola is not high. It's around 50%. And methods for diagnostics of it are not very, not very good right now. So we created some Ebola targets, Amplicon sequence, and also we prepared some RNA. We actually have an actual sample of Ebola RNA, <laughs> but we didn't bring it here. <laughs> so don't, don't worry. We don't have Ebola sample here, but it's in, in space. And the next step of this project will be actual work with Ebola sample, trying to detect it by our method and compare it to the standard sequences. This was before Trump, no? Trump yeah. is shipping in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, no, I, maybe, maybe, but yeah. It's, it's, it's going to take some. We are lucky, it's very uh, heavily regulated, so we are not allowed to take it from class two lab. No. Wait a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Ebola. And our goal was to, to detect it very specifically if we now have in hand this, this method and compare it to the existing sequence. So what we did, we got the sequence, we synthesized RNA. We also got the actual sample, which is still not here. Anyway, and we created this uh, adjusted probes, as we call them, synthesized them, and then we run the assay. So here I want to say the, uh, show you the result of this assay. This is a gel, the standard way of analysis for, for, the, for the nucleic acid product. We also characterized this by PCR, by next generation sequencing, which we are also using. Again, don't get me wrong, it's not 
that it's not working, it does, but we just want to improve it for the detection of mutations. And also HPLC and MS analysis, mass spec analysis. Uh, this bands you can see on the gel. This are these reads, these cake products. So when we have the correct <coughs> target, this Ebola RNA target, it gives this big band here, which is approximately 100, 180 nucleotide long. <coughs> when we have a wrong target, for example, influenza RNA, there is, there is no of this band here. So there are some short-term products. And this is what we wanted to see, basically. If we, want to, if we can distinguish between the, the RNA target and the wrong one. This is just to sum up how we ended up actually sequencing one and a half thousand nucleotides by this method because we overlapped these reads. So imagine again, this is your target RNA. And we have one read, 200 nucleotide, then 200 nucleotide, 200, 200, 200, 200. You can go pretty long this way, given that one can synthesize all these probes, which I'm also going to talk about later on. It's a pain to get that many nucleotide probes by existing methods. And when we overlap this by simply by the design, then we can easily place them and, and assign where in this target each particular read is positioned. As I already showed, when there is a mutation, this is our goal, this long read is not going to be created. So we can easily see it by gel that there has been a mutation. And what is good about this method? It is direct. It is direct, directly working on RNA. It's not, it doesn't require to get the DNA first, which is nice. It saves time, saves reagents. And we also put fluorescent dyes. We like fluorescence here working. And we could detect it by, by <coughs> as well and quantify our reads. So using microscopy, we could get down to as little as one picomolar, I think it's like five or one picomolar RNA target. One picomolar, it's, it's very good sensitivity for virus, uh, for viral RNA. And Workflow compared to next generation sequence, it took only two hours to do that versus four, seven days for the standard sequencing. And I put here in a parenthesis, never, because not everything can be actually sequenced by next generation sequencing. Some targets are not just not working. And I think that this method could be a good solution for targets like that. Um, so when we we have to optimize this assay further and develop a better work analysis. Again, I said this is a pilot study, just to proof of principle, basically. Read length is crucial. So the length, how, how many of those clicked oligonucleotides are put together is very important for sequencing application. Human genome has three billion of nucleotides alone, so this is a lot. And um, yeah, I don't know. We have never thought about sequencing a genome by this method, like in human genome. It's now designed for small parts of it. But anyway, bioinformatics says that shorter reads are better, actually, than the long ones. And that makes it simple for chemistry because it's, it gives better yields to align, to click together shorter, uh, shorter DNAs. There at Stanford, where I collaborated on this project, they actually now try to do six mer, only six nucleotide long reads, and then they click them together. The problem with that short, short reads is that the assay has to be below five degrees Celsius in order to bind them to the target. This requires call room. <laughs> so they have, this is my collaborator at Stanford, who is now trying this out. And all of that, I have personally tried to work in the lab, which is zero degrees Celsius. <laughs> it's, I, I, I really like, don't hurry up to, to set up this ascension. It's quite, a, quite an experience to sit and squeeze there. Yeah, anyway, but this is something we are trying now. We are trying to shorten actually this, each particular oligonucleotide to only six. Yeah, and then use lo a library of them, lots of them, to, to sequence uh, longer. Sorry, can I yes. ask a question? But I mean, in the, in the, in vivo, typically it's not five degrees, it's higher. So no. what is, don't you also bias your sample in the same way? 
um, by actually going to Borough Temperate. You can also have fist and speech decision in all kinds of things. Fest kind of from temperate. Right? This is an in vitro. So this so is not one of the, yeah, okay. this is for in vitro. Which system. means that not necessarily that applies to living, mm. if you have the Ebola in the real being. Serum. So take serum from a patient that still is going to be fine. And this guy, he's doing oncology study, so he's not going to do any in vivo stuff. Oh, but it's it is, it would be different in vivo and in vivo. It, it would be nice to compare. Right now, right now, we even cannot compare, right? So if we could just get an option. Yeah. Case study generally. Yes. It's just something under the development right now. Maybe, uh, <laughs> yeah. since you're on the slide. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how the overlapping is done, but the six man itself is not particularly specific. No. So, but uh, um, maybe you overlap yourself out of that problem. Uh, yeah, so there are ways to handle that. They are all biomimetic. Uh, so you have libraries, and then there are like barcodes. So it has, it's actually longer, it's six man device, and then it has a barcode. And then by cycles of annealing the annealing. very engineering like work uh, so a lot of this is not my expertise so I, I'm just getting in touch with collaborators get amazed what they can do there <laughs> like technical my, it's microfluidic engineering some advanced bioinformatics based on the uses like cycles of annealing detection yeah but it's exciting what is going to happen now. Yes. and it's all LNA model detection of mutations. I just wanted to show where the sensitivity is right now. This is the old fluorescence detection of probes, which have been labeled. And we could never get down lower than, so you can see 500 nanomolar concentrations, very high, at 0 0.5 micromolar. When we move the assay in, to the solid phase and to microscopy, we actually get down to atom molar concentrations of DNA that you can see the spots here on this slide. These are DNA molecules that are labeled by the dye. Atom molar is actually way too low. Very few species have that little amount of stuff. So it's way below the limit that is needed, actually. So it's quite, quite good to, to apply microscopy for the detection. And perspective is. Uh, create an extended library of short clickable probes, optimize an oligonucleotide synthesis for preparation of this sequencing probe. The way we are synthesizing them right now is, is very high. Um, it, it requires lots of materials. It's very expensive to do it right now the way we are doing. So we are thinking how to do it in a different approach so we can have thousands of these probes mm -hmm. easily and cheaper. And then applying microscopy for detection and quantification of so we are working right now on how we precisely quantify it. And this is actually an amazing point I forgot to say. So sequencing when it affects by amplification, it's not quantitative. No one can say how much of the target has been initial. We, we are trying to quantify it directly, which is interesting. I'm actually curious to know how many of those are in the sample A. And testing more targets will be yeah, a good, a good next step. Some questions I want to leave you, and I'm speculating about, and please write me if you have ideas on that. So what is the future of personalized genomics, right? So what is it all going to when we have access to all the sequencing data, right? I presented viruses, but it's potentially all of it can be applied for human genome. And how can ultra-fast sequencing methods affect research community, clinical work, and the society? So right now, in order to do this, Sequencing. You need to send a sample somewhere or go to the doctor and wait for weeks. Imagine if it's there, right, in a minute, right, all the sequences. How, what, what will happen? <laughs> How can we apply that? Is it good? Is it bad? Yeah. I'm definitely speculating about all of that. And want also you to leave you out with this thought. What, is it necessarily that good <laughs> to have access to all of that data? I want to finish.
by acknowledgement that this is my group here in Odense. Some of them are actually present. Yeah, I, I am very happy about working with you guys. Thank you for, for all the great work. I, I'm, I have not done any, anything of what I presented myself, so it's all done by their hands. And I'm also very happy about my, co my collaborators and continuous inspiration they are providing. Also, I want to thank NAC, uh, Nuclear Cancer Center, and Su University of Southern Denmark. And also the money, we actually, this is quite costly, <laughs> what we are doing. So it's Willem Foundation, National Institutes of Health USA that are sponsoring our work. At the end, I want to say thank you all for this opportunity and thank you for the kindest attention. Thank you. Thank you for this interesting presentation. Presentation that is now open for comments or, or questions. So please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether this is a little bit too technical. But uh, if I understand right, the core technology is that you sort of, uh, by click reaction, link the fragments of the individual probes. But uh, with the background of the EU template, the DNA chemistry, we know that these sort of intramolecular click reactions will be very fast and very efficient, mm -hmm. even if there are one or two or three mismatches at the sort of dangling ends where you do the click reaction. So they will happily go together. If you have very short probes, like a six mirror, and you have yeah. both sides three dingling ends, which will perfectly happy mm -hmm. sort of do the click reaction. How will you sort of maintain a specificity? If you go to longer probes, you will have more specificity, yeah. Yeah. but still uh, mismatches in the sort of mm. uh, either ends of the oligo will be sort of probably not affect the speed of the click reaction very much, mm. or sometimes even improve uh, because it's sort mm -hmm. of more flexible. Uh, how is that uh, going to mm -hmm. sort of fundamentally affect? Uh, yeah, so thank you. That's a good question. So for long ones, for long weeks, we have tested that. So we have this mismatch. Actually here you can see one control with slide number six with the mismatch actually at the end. It's not forming. But there is a technical step which is called warm wash. Mm -hmm. So we have warm buffer. And this is LNA that does the trick. So you can increase a bit of temperature of washing of unbound stuff. And makes it very specific. It makes a big difference for longer probes. But the chemistry would actually work, but you remove the oligo before yes. you actually go into yes, the chemistry. Yes, yes, and this is a good one. So yeah. we had a control, and if there is no LNA there, this is not working. But the big difference for match versus mismatch of like 10 degrees that LNA is being gives us the chance to wash off on specific stuff. When it's six mer softening, uh, what we are looking into is polynomes, G, 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 for example. So it, this approach, which I showed six mer, it's not for decoding this mixed mer sequences. This is not going to be specific. But it's for, for some certain regions, and it's working there. And for example, G code nuclear sense comes fine lane. For some more specific sequences, we expect that it can, can do it. Yeah, so going back to in, in vivo, um, where is the limit or what cannot be done with clickable elements or what could be done with clickable elements? Then you said like short mm -hmm. reads, you need to have low temperatures, but like. Mm -hmm. For longer reads, the way I understood it, it might be possible. Mm -hmm. And so basically, just in, in terms of understanding how particular mm -hmm. the elements could resolve really mm -hmm. real-time uh, reads of RNA. Mm -hmm. uh, so what it can do, it can definitely sequence some, some short part of RNA. Let's say microRNA, something very, very well characterized, we know where it is, we know what we look for. This, in this version, it cannot decode sequence without knowing <coughs> what we're looking into. So you need original actual sequencing data in order to create the probes. If there is, you, you see an effect, for example, some, some effect of the gene, you don't know the sequence of it, or don't have any idea what it could be, then this method is not going to work. <coughs> yeah, but you could, detect actually actual mutation rates at the yes, source. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. 
given that the, you have initial genome yeah. sequenced by something else. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting, we are, not we are not on a hurry for in vivo work. 90% of all the, it's all diagnostic in vitro, <laughs> so we stick a bit to, but research-wise, of course, in vivo stuff is interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't quite get the transition from uh, mutation analysis to, to sequencing mm -hmm. full genome. So this is a mutation analysis, yeah. is that right? Yeah. So, what I, I, so this is you isolate the virus RNA, mm -hmm. and then you hybridize your probes, and then you look for, for gene fragments. Why did you use those long fractions? I didn't get that. Why didn't you use the tenmer for mm -hmm. the tenmer? Um, I said it probably not very clearly in the beginning. So all the detection of mutation is potentially sequencing of the bigger. You can extend it. Mm -hmm. So in the here we looked for a mutation, but then got curious how far we can go with it, and we ended up with fifteen hundred. Typical, and then we compared it to the technology right now, which is with NGS. It reached 300 this time, 300 only, and we already did 1500. So, in principle, our point here is that it works very well for mutations, actually, for short regions. But it can do more than that, probably. It can be used for, for larger. So for the short probes, where 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 is a mutation best placed? If you have a six mer, I, I agree fully. You have to go for short probes. Um, if you have any six mer on eight mer, mm -hmm. is the mismatch? Where does it mostly decrease the click rate? At towards the end or okay. towards the middle? Short also edge. for the short ones? Yes, yes absolutely. Because you might get all or none. I have a more general question. I mean, how predictable mutations are? And would they, I mean, there are probably people who come to a system mm -hmm. where the system is in, but how much is known about the dynamics of mutations per se? I mean, now in the same you want to study once something has happened and it didn't happen, you can try that. But it's a lot of them happening all the time. I, see. Um, I want to say a number that about, about 10% of genomes are so they, is there mostly random, or do you do environment? I mean, so this is the way we adapt, actually, yeah. yeah. So it's due to the environment, basically. Yes, yes. So this is also why Ebola has a lot of them. It adapts very fast. Yeah. How many are repaired? Those which do not benefit, they get repaired. Those that create some benefit and phenotype, they stay. First they are repaired and then some stay and those that stay they might end up showing the wing and yeah. advantage. Yeah. And then so um, that's I think it's a different kind of repair. There's these neutrals that are happening and then disappear. And some they stay because there's a pressure from like for example we start treating the virus with some drug and then it develops a mutation that helps it to survive. <coughs> those which do not have this mutation will be eliminated and the one which has will more of it and it will stay. This is the, how the theory is now. Yes. One more question. Yeah. How is the actual detection done? I mean, you show a gel down, or gel is not particularly convenient for routine analytics. So how is it actually done on a gel? Of course, you can see whether you have a full length uh, fragment or, or anything shorter. Uh, how is that? Sort of the the yeah. Then you would see any length as long as there is a we label it in a certain way that only the full one gets that's the type. Yeah. HPLC was good, but it's not that sensitive. No. But HPLC is easy one. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for showing us the <laughs>